Institute for Global uh, Public Health. I am Scarlett Cornelison, a professor in the Department of Political Science at Stellenbosch University. I am chairing today's webinar. I would like to extend a welcome to Mr. Akiko Uchikawa, Minister and Deputy Chief of Mission in the Embassy of Japan in South Africa. This webinar is co-hosted by the Department of Political Science and the Embassy of Japan and is the next edition in a series of collaborations between the two. So um, Stellenbosch University and the Embassy of Japan have been organizing seminars on a range of topics over the past year or so. Today's webinar focuses on the advances in biomedical and scientific research in the treatment and prevention of HIV. And we know that HIV and also uh, it's relatedly AIDS has been with us for more than four decades now. And uh, we will be discussing the progress um, that has been made by the International Scientific Committee in the development of an HIV vaccine. We have three speakers on this topic, whom I will introduce one by one. Let me hand over to Professor Elmi Miller, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch, to do the welcoming on behalf of the university. Professor Miller is a transplant surgeon she pioneered a transplant program for HIV positive recipients in South Africa using HIV positive donors. And Professor Miller also holds an A1 rating for research with the National Research Foundation of South Africa. So with that, I hand over to Professor Miller. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cornelison. It's an honor to um, open this uh, webinar with you, which is so important. Um, I would like to welcome everybody um, from all over the world, but specifically would like to acknowledge uh, Minister uh, Uchikawa from um, Japan. Wonderful to have you here and thank you for your support in running this program. I think in South Africa, HIV is a very topical disease. Uh, we know that it affects a large amount of our population. It's estimated that between 20 and 23 percent of our population are still uh, HIV positive. And we've worked as a scientific community um, in many ways to try and improve for the live, living circumstances of those people who live with HIV. Um, we've come a very long way in terms of uh, getting treatment for our patients in the sort of years 2005 six where we struggled to get access to antiretrovirals. And today we are at a point where uh, some of our top researchers are working on things like vaccine development and um, HIV uh, cure. So it's a wonderful privilege to have you all here. Um, thank you from the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch University for inviting us to this event and for um, all your arrangements in this regard and we look forward to hearing uh, these exciting talks. Thank you very much. Uh, before I hand over to um, Minister Uchikawa um, for a welcome on behalf of the Embassy of Japan, a uh, introduction to Minister Uchikawa. Uh, as indicated, he is um, Deputy Chief of Mission in the Embassy of Japan in South Africa, and um, he is a former minister in the economic section of the Embassy of Japan in the Kingdom uh, of Thailand. Uh, minister, minister Uchikawa has also served as the Director, Economic Security Division, Economic Affairs, and uh, the Economic Affairs Bureau um, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and also in um, the ministry of, he, he, he held capacity in the ministry of um, agriculture, uh, forestry and fisheries in Japan. So Minister Uchikawa, thank you so much. Minister, you, you, uh, could you please uh, unmute yourself? Okay, thank you very much, Professor Cornelison. Um, Professor Muller, Professor Gray, Professor Pham Peters Basix, Professor Yastomi, distinguished experts and scholars at Stellenbosch University, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to join today's seminar. The topic is quite timely and relevant against the current background of the pandemic around the world 
because people are much more concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on HIV patients. I'm also delighted to have Professor Yestomi, today's guest speaker, who will present the latest findings and efforts by the top Japanese e expert. The Embassy of Japan presented, suggested the, this topic of today to Stellenbosch University some month ago, bearing mind, in mind two points. Firstly, South Africa has its history of fighting the disease and is a top runner of patient's care. In this context, this embassy wanted to provide an opportunity for South African people to be informed of the latest research result in Japan. Secondly, this seminar may present possibilities of further collaboration between the relevant stakeholders of our two countries in the field. And regarding the second point, Japan has been promoting initiatives for the achievement of universal health coverage in order to overcome the current pandemic, strengthen health system against the future health crises, and also to ensure health health security in wider fields. Here in South Africa, for example, JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, has been collaborating with South African authorities in a series of capacity building projects for health sector budget management for local governments. And also, uh, we have a, a project, another example is a project for the provision of of a mobile clinic for TB and HIV investigative network in Durban. The Embassy of Japan would like to continue its collaborations and the contributions to academic exchanges and collaborations between the African continent and Japan through Stellenbosch University as the hub of communication and activities. This partnership is even more relevant in this year of TCAT 8 the eighth round of Tokyo International Conference on African Development to be held this August. Lastly, I would like to express my gratitude to the distinguished panelists for their time and also to the team of Stellenbosch University led by Professor Cornelissian, who has made this webinar possible. I close my remarks by hoping that the discussion today will serve as a stepping stone to create a conference of expert knowledge in a broader context of Japan-South Africa relations, and as well as of global impact for the future of the mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Uchikao, also for the, um, for the kind words towards Stellenbosch University. I would now like to introduce um, our first speaker. It's Professor Yasuhiro Yasutumi. Yasutomi. Professor Yasutomi is an immunologist who works in the field of vaccine development. He is the director and chairman of the Laboratory of Im Immunoregulation and Vaccine Research in the National Institutes of Biomedical Innovation, Health and Nutrition in Japan, and is also a professor at Mie University Graduate School of Medicine in Japan. The title of his talk is Possibility of AIDS Vaccine Development, Long-Term Sterile Immunity Induced by an Adjuvant Containing Live Attenuated AIDS Virus. And um, this uh, talk is based on um, results, uh, very promising results that his laboratory and his team recently produced and which was reported on um, in a number of publications, including Nature um, and, uh, and, and others. So, uh, Professor Astomi, I hand over to you if you'd like to uh, share, your share your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, okay. Can you see? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to such a wonderful meeting. I'm honored for giving me an opportunity to speak about my recent research for AIDS vaccine. I have already been interested in and focused on the African continent because of disease that are heavily involved in my project are tuberculosis and AIDS. 
The mission of my institute is practical use of basic research. To that end, we are focusing on medical science research using primate. This purpose requires the cooperation of African people, and it seems that the research results have a great impact on the health and life of African people. I hope that we can promote research for practical use through this lecture in our future. So, okay, uh, AIDS is a disease caused by HIV infection. Of course, you know, uh, this virus destroyed the Oh, sorry. This virus destroyed the immune system. Okay, I already explained that. Uh, Chairman explained this type of things, but I also said current status of HIV and AIDS. HIV remains a major global public health problem, and affected people as a. And this is a 2020 data, uh, 37.7 million about 37.7 million and more than two thirds of infected people are in Africa. And uh, uh, every year, every year, oh no, no, 20, 20 so about uh, or less than 1 million people died from uh, HIV and 1.5 million people are newly infected with HIV. HIV can be controlled with the anti-HIV drug now, but there is no cure for HIV infection. So AIDS research has made significant pro progress in biological analysis, pathological study, immunological research, and the development of a therapeutic agents. Since 40 years of world-class researchers have continued to study AIDS, however, we have no AIDS vaccine yet. Sorry, such a busy slide. This slide shows the current status of AIDS vaccine clinical trial. Despite the attention of the worldwide about AIDS vaccine, there are no, still no good results. Vaccine trial conducted in Africa, which were considered to be the most effective, were also continued last year on February with poor results. From now on, I'm going to talk about the, our vaccine study. We can take good medicine against AIDS now. HIV is no longer deadly infection by the development of effective anti-HIV drugs. Then even if you are infected with HIV, you can solve the problem by taking medicine. So this is a question, and the anti-HIV drug cannot completely treat, uh, terminate the viruses. And needs lifelong medication and side, side effects of long-term medication. And it's a very, very high cost, very expensive. And the emergence of anti-HIV drug resistant virus, we, didn't, we know that. If taking HIV drugs are stopped, yes. So people develop the AIDS. If we infected HIV can be eliminated from the body, it will lead to cure. Therefore, new vaccine treatments aim to aims at uh, eradicating the HIV uh, elimination in vivo is desired. I'm going to explain our vaccine. It has been reported that nephrine treated AIDS virus becomes attenuated virus, and this attenuated AIDS virus was thought, thought to be a candidate of attenuated AIDS vaccine. However, this attenuated virus, which is a candidate of live vaccine, cannot prevent the AIDS virus infection. On the other hand, I have been studying vaccine adjuvant, especially anti-ADYV, which is one of the major proteins for mycobacteria, uh, such as uh, tuberculosis bacteria. This NEF gene deleted attenuated virus cannot induce enough response with the protection of AIDS virus infection. So we constructed a new attenuated virus vaccine. The NEF deleted viruses having adjuvant molecule anti ADYV were constructed. Uh, 
cyanogenous monkeys are infected as well infected with as well as sieve SHIV, dilated NF gene, and encoding adjuvant anti-85B uh, gene or NF gene deleted sieve, sieve NI as a control. Surprisingly, sieve anti-85B cannot be detected in cyanomologous monkeys after infection. No matter how attenuated the AIDS virus is, the AIDS virus is usually persistently infected and is not disappeared from the body. The control of sib ni is a persistently infected according to the usual principles. Furthermore, interferon gamma was more strongly induced in sib antigen 85b group, suggesting that the function of cell-mediated immunity was enhanced and the AIDS virus was eliminated. So this, uh, this uh, figure shows the probable results it's a uh, probable DNA can be detected in four weeks after infection. However, eight uh, after eight weeks, we cannot detect it, the probable DNA. So, CBH85 cannot be detected in cyanomonas macaque after infection. The NEF deleted virus showed us sequential infection. Furthermore, interferon gamma was more strongly induced in the CBH85 B group, suggesting that the function of cell-mediated immunity was enhanced and the AIDS virus was eliminated. So I'm going to summarize this result. So strong cell immune responses eliminate CYBH85B in the early stage of infection of CYBH85B and large number of interferon gamma producing T cells are transiently elicited in the early phase of infection and CYBH85B we were eliminated. Next, we will assess the protective effects against highly pathogenic AIDS virus. Sib anti 85V or Sib NY in injected monkeys were inaugurated with highly pathogenic AIDS virus Sib 89.6P at 37 weeks after Sib anti 85V infection. Virulent AIDS virus could not be detected in plasma in monkeys, but since they are infected with control virus CBNI. On the other hand, monkeys transiently infected with the adjuvant added AIDS virus CBNG85B showed different results. Plasma viral load was below the detection limit six of seven monkeys. Highly pathogenic AIDS virus could not be detected in six monkeys. So when highly virulent AIDS virus was uh, challenged after vaccination with CYBH85B, the virulent AIDS virus was below the detection limit six out of seven animals. In the CBNY vaccinated group, highly virulent AIDS virus were detected in all animals. I'm going to summarize the results. Uh, when the virulent AIDS virus was inoculated after vaccination with CYBH85B, the virulent AIDS virus was below the detection limit in six or out of seven animals. The production of important large cytokines, such as interferon gamma and IL-2, suggests that the high, highly virulent AIDS virus were eliminated by the enhancing the function of cell-mediated immunity. So, pathogenic AIDS virus could not be detected in four out of six monkeys. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, next, we confirmed the, the elimination of a highly pathogenic AIDS virus from the monkeys as follows. Lymphocyte and lymph node cells collected from CYBH85B vaccinated monkeys with no detection by a load of highly virulent strains, SIP were administered to healthy naive monkeys. So two monkeys are, so it's, uh, this is a recipient monkeys result. Two healthy monkeys showed the viral load, but 
four monkeys could not be detected in a virus in plasma. So pathogenic AIDS virus could not be detected in four out of six monkeys. So, so uh, 85.6 of CBI and 85 V immunized monkeys did not show pyramia after pathogenic AIDS virus infection. Moreover, cellular immunity against pathogenic AIDS virus was confirmed in 57.1% of CB uh, anti 85 v immunized monkeys. The 28.6 CB anti 85 v immunized monkeys control pathogenic AIDS virus infection, but not elimination of pathogenic AIDS virus. Finally, we examined elimination of AIDS virus in various lymphoid tissue at the necropsy. Examine the probiotic DNA of the virulent strain of sieve in each lymphoid tissues of six animals in which the virulent strain sieve is not detected in plasma. The virulent strain sieve could not be detected in each lymphoid tissues in four monkeys. These four monkeys completely eliminated the virulent AIDS virus from in vivo tissues. I'm going to summarize the results of this study. Immunization of recombinant, <coughs> sorry, nef deleted AIDS virus carrying the gene of adjuvant molecule induce strong cellular immune responses. These responses attack the virulent of AIDS virus, and this response brought about the results such as the elimination of uh, controlling or AIDS virus. I'm going to talk about next plan against AIDS virus infection. I have a plan for therapeutic vaccine because the vaccine effect of our vaccine can eliminate already infected AIDS virus. People infected with AIDS virus usually take medicine daily. After the con continuing anti-HIV drug administration, inaugurate c anti-85V and analyze the viral dynamics of AIDS virus. AIDS virus is isolated each, pa uh, each patient and the NEF deleted recombinant virus, AIDS virus expressing as bound molecule and chain 5 b should be constructed in each person. This tailor-made vaccine should be integrated to each patient. Today, I already talked about the current AIDS patient status. People infected with HIV need to take an anti-HIV drug for a life, for a life, uh, long lifetime. And, but in this vaccine therapy, the adjuvant molecule exerts a strong cell-mediated immunity enhancing effect, and it has possibility to completely eliminate virus from the body and leading to cure. Treatment with the terror-made vaccine, as shown in the previous slide, is possible in countries with few infected people, such, uh, such as Japan. But if there are many infected people, such as Africa, it requires quite a long time, many researchers and high-quality facilities. So we think another approach for African patients. The method is to construct a common sequence virus from the epidemic virus in Africa and make a live attenuated vaccine expressing adjuvant molecule. With this method, many uh, patients can be treated in a short period of time, and it can also be a preventive vaccine against infection. This is my last slide. So uh, today I showed the two types of strategy. One is a telomere vaccine, and another thing is a common sequence vaccine. It's a live alternative vaccine as a, as a therapeutic, not only therapeutic vaccine, but also a preventive vaccine, I hope. And I need your uh, African people's help because uh, we need many patients, and also we have to help the people infected with HIV, I hope. So, uh, thank you for attentions. 
Thank you very much, Professor Yasutomi. So we will have a discussion um, of the presentations after um, Professor Gray's presentation, and there will also be a Q and A, um, a, a session. We've got we've set aside ten minutes for a general Q and A, and um, we uh, uh, ask you that you post your um, your comments or your questions to the to the speakers using the the chat function, please, and that will be discussed in the Q and A um, session. Uh, so while Professor Yasutomi is um, uh, stopping the sharing of his presentation, I will introduce uh, our next speaker, Professor Glenda Gray. Uh, she is the president and the CEO of the South African Medical Research Council. Uh, she's an, an NRFA A1 rated scientist. Um, Professor Glenda Gray is a qualified pediatrician and co-founder of the internationally recognized perinatal HIV research unit in Soweto, South Africa. She is also chairperson of the board of the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases and a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies in the United States. She received South Africa's highest honor, the order of uh, Mapungubwe for her pioneering research and other prestigious accolades include the Nelson Mandela Health and Human Rights Award for her significant contribution in the field of mother to child transmission of HIV. We look forward to your presentation, Professor Gray. Thanks. Okay. Can you? Okay. So I'm going to, should I put my, 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 do you want my video off? Uh, okay. Um, uh, you're on mute. I can't hear what you're saying. You can have your video on, so that's, okay. that's fine. Okay. So, Minister Uchikawu, sorry, Minister Uchikawu, um, um, honourable members of the Dean of Facu the Dean of Medicine at um, um, the Faculty of Medicine at Stellenbosch, um, the Political Science Department, um, all protocols have preserved, and and thank you very much for inviting me to give a, a talk. So I'm going to give a more global talk um, on, on HIV vaccines. And um, I'm doing this as an HIV vaccine researcher, as well as the um, um, the HVTN, which is the HIV Vaccine Clinical Trials Network co-principal investigator. So thank you very much for allowing me to talk. So just in terms of HIV vaccine R&D, um, we know that HIV is a 40-year year unchecked pandemic. Um, last year was a pivotal year for vaccine development, and I'll go through some of those um, discoveries from last year. But we also have to acknowledge that the HIV vaccine field has been the NASA of vaccinology, and HIV vac vaccine science has been the backbone for the development of successful COVID-19 vaccines. And if it wasn't for the, the input we did for HIV vaccines, we would never have been able to pivot um, our platforms uh, both the A26 and the mRNA platforms to develop develop very successful um, COVID vaccines. And um, I'll also talk about some new technologies um, from and learning from the COVID experience like mRNA, um, bring us some optimism for developing and neutralizing base vaccine for HIV. These are the HIV vaccine clinical trial sites at a global level. And you can see that we have a huge expansion of HIV vaccine clinical research sites in Africa that have been um, developed to do the phase three trials that we've been conducting in the last um, uh, couple of years. So why do we need um, an HIV vaccine? And the question we, we pose is that will we ever be able to add an HIV vaccine to this toolbox? There's a lot of interventions that we have uh, for preventing HIV, but we have yet to do um, find an HIV vaccine. And why has it been so hard to develop an HIV vaccine? So there are lots of um, lots of issues, but some of the science issues are that the genet genetic genetic diversity of the virus is greater than any other pathogen. The envelope is less immunogenic than any other virus envelope protein, um, perhaps because of its glycan shield, which which hides um, the immun the immunogenic parts of the of the envelope. Some parts of the HIV trimer create diversionary antibodies, and there are fewer trimers on the surface than most viruses. So it's a very bold virus, and um, the neutralizing antibodies cannot cross-link. Um, there are no human cures for HIV, and hence there are no immunological models to mimic. So of the 72 million 
uh, people who've got HIV, there have been zero cures and we're still counting. So just in terms of the history of HIV vaccines, there was a general optimism in the, from 1985 to 2000 um, that recombinant vaccines would, could work. Um, there was the VaxGen trial and we, there was no efficacy and we had no real understanding as to why there was no efficacy. From 2000 to 2010, um, everybody jumped on the T cell uh, responses because when we saw that T cell responses were conserved, uh, there was a, there was an idea of pursuing um, um, HIV vaccine research that could induce um, T cell responses, and we saw the STEP and the Pambili and the and the HP10505 trial. So three trials, one in South Africa and two two trials um, in the Americas, uh, were developed with the T cell response. Um, and and what we what we saw from this is that um, there was a need to to have envelope antibodies in our vaccines, and the antigenic breadth was an issue and the genetic diversity was an issue for both the T cells and the antibodies. And um, um, we had to look at how we could um, um, how we could design conserved epitopes and there was work done um, with Lewis Pickers looking at the, the uh, in rhesus macaques looking at CMV vectors. In 2014 to 2020, um, uh, we started to look at passive antibodies, uh, antibody studies suggesting that neutralizing antibodies could prevent infection. And the and the, um, um, the AMP study, which I'll, I'll give you um, some data on, confirmed this result. And, um, and uh, we have tried to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies by, 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 by doing primers, um, but this has been um, quite difficult. And we sit here in 28, from 2018 to present, recognizing that um, that the only way to make a successful HIV vaccine is to produce neutralizing antibodies, um, and this requires um, a new, a unique way of elicita eliciting the infrequent mutations that are needed for antibodies to develop. So last year was a pivotal year for the HIV vaccine field. In 2015, we set up uh, on a strategy to execute a series of efficacy trials to define whether non-neutralizing antibodies could be elicited at high enough titers to be clinical, clinically useful, and also to determine if we could prevent HIV acquisition with broadly neutralizing antibodies as, as a model for, for broadly neutralizing antibody-inducing vaccines. And we now have provided the answers to this program and can develop another scope of work. So when we were in 25, 2015, we had two approaches. One was an empirical approach and one was a theoretical approach. And the empirical approach was based on the study that came out of Thailand called the RV144 Thai study. And this was um, showing, showed a vaccine trial that showed modest um, efficacy and, um, and essentially showed that, um, that, that non-neutralizing antibodies uh, could protect against infection. And so what we, got, what, what we did with this study was to develop vaccines to improve the potency and the durability of non-neutralizing anti-OMF V2 antibodies based on the correlates from the RV144 study. And then there was a theoretical approach um, with the question of could we induce broadly neutralizing antibodies and could these antibodies protect against HIV acquisition? And the one approach was to, to, um, to use immunoprophylaxis with broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, and the other one was to see whether we could actively vaccinate people and induce broadly neutralizing antibody responses. So with the active immunization to induce binding antibodies, um, we, um, we um, embarked on two, three studies, the HV10702, the HV10705, and the HV10706. And this, this, this whole hypothesis was, could we stimulate binding antibodies that had been previously been shown to be correlated with a re reduced risk of HIV acquisition, either in non-human primate models or in the RB144. And we, we, we set about to answer these questions in these, in these studies. The other question we asked is, could we use a preformed broadly neutralizing antibody like the VRC01, which was a neutralizing antibody targeting the CD4 binding site? And we tested this in the HV10703 or AMP study. Um, and um, there are other, obviously, neutralizing antibodies that are targeting other sites that are um, on the envelope, which are being evaluated in phase one. And then the other question which we are embarking upon now is whether we could actually coax the immune system to develop broadly neutralizing antibodies with immunogens, example, um, lineage-based vaccine design, germline targeting, or epitope-based vaccine design, to try and see whether we could induce the neutralizing antibodies that we saw um, in some people who were chronically infected with with HIV. 
And this has been our strategy since 2015. And these are the studies um, that we've been embarking upon. The HP10702, which um, was adapted from the RB144 study conducted in South Africa, where we looked at a clade C LVAC or a pox, or a pox vector um, with, a, with, with an envelope GP120 with an adjuvant MF59. We then also implemented HP10705, which, which was an adeno 26 vaccine platform with, with antigens from a, a various clades um, at a global level. And we had a, a, a bio, we had a clade C GP140 that, that we um, used to boost this regimen. And ongoing at the moment is the HP10706, um, which is happening in the Americas, and I'll go into that. In terms of making vaccines that induce body neutralizing antibodies, we have a couple of, um, uh, of trials in, 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 in humans that are looking at alternate virus, viral vectors and envelope proteins, and also um, some phase one studies looking at recombinant envelope immunogens for inducing body neutralizing antibodies with alternative adjuvants. And we've been using this in South Africa in, um, in a study looking at preventing mother to child transmission. And then obviously we have the um, 705, 703 and 704 study, which looked at um, the VRCO1 um, monoclonal antibody that just targeted against the CD4 binding site of the envelope. And we will present that data. So why did we do separate trials of non-neutralizing vaccine approaches? Why did we do both 702 and 705? And we did this because um, the correlates of protection um, had some overlap, but there were some differences. And so we decided to, to pursue both approaches. The RV144 or HV, and HV10702, um, we looked at the V2 loop, the GP120 binding, ADCC and ADCP, um, as well as HIV-specific CD4 T-cell responses. These were correlates of protection, and we used these to um, as markers of, of um, whether we could induce uh, protection. And then um, the 705 was was um, was based on an A26 regimen that showed uh, in non-human primates um, a correlates of protection with GP140 binding with ADCP and ELISPOT. We also knew that the magnitude and epitope-specific responses of both vaccine approaches and breadth differed, and this overlap and diversity would help us uh, see whether non-neutralizing um, um, immune responses are correlated and what areas of the viral envelope are susceptible to clinically effective immune pressure. So it was very important to do these two studies. So at the end of 2021, we knew that the AMP study could work, which was the body neutralizing antibody uh, vaccine. We knew that the HV10702, which looked at the LVAC GP120, didn't work. And we also knew that Imbacoda, that looked at the AD26 GP140, didn't work. And the only um, phase uh, three trial that's still ongoing in HIV vaccines is the Mosaico or phase three, which is looking at a similar regimen uh, to Imbacoda, but in, um, in the Americas. So just quickly, the 702 study, um, or, or Humbo study, um, looked at the an LVAC prime, um, and then an LVAC prime, and, and then a boost with LVAC and a a, a GP120 MF59 adjuvant um, at month three, six, twelve, and we added an 18-month boost to to optimize um, immune responses. Um, and this was based on data from HP10100 that showed us that the immune response was was waning. And this study, uh, which was led by me, uh, we, sh we saw did not work. So this, this shows you the Kaplan-Myers on the right that showed you um, that that uh, whichever way we cut the cake, um, uh, this vaccine uh, was inert and didn't induce um, any protection. Um, and that the whole, the whole um, idea that we could induce binding antibodies to protect against acquisition, um, you know, was this was was not shown to be true in in HV10702. The A26 J and J vaccine program was a program initiated by Dan Baruch, and the, as I mentioned before, it had a recombinant A26 vector priming. The mosaic inserts were designed by Betty Korber. We added a recombinant protein boost after the HV10505 study, and we had correlates of protection based on low-dose mucosal challenges in the rhesus macaques. And these correlates protection were based on non-neutralizing antibodies again and T-cell responses. So this just shows you the, um, the non-human primate experiment that showed that the AD26 prime and the AD boost um, um, uh, had a 66 um, uh, reduction in acquisition, a 94% per risk, risk, uh, risk uh, reduction and 66% um, full protection after six challenges. And based on that, um, we, we looked at the correlates and, and the Elispot and ELISA correlated with protection in the non-human primate study. 
Um, and we also found that ADCP were found to correlate with protection, as has been observed in previous studies. So we designed the study called Imbacoda, where we where we primed with the Adeno 26 um, vaccine at months zero and three, and then boosted with the A26 plus a a, a clade a GP140 clade C um, uh, um, uh, protein boost. Um, the study was conducted in um, in East and Southern Africa. We enrolled 2,637 women in 23 sites in five countries. And yeah, you can see that again, although there was more uh, infections in the vaccine, um, in the placebo arm as compared to the vaccine, this vaccine did not uh, protect women. And we saw high rates of HIV incidence, 3.61% um, 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 in vaccine arm and 4.32% the placebo arm. So what we've shown is very high rates of HIV incidence in South Africa, um, which hasn't changed over time. And we show that this vaccine, um, in this proof of concept study, that this vaccine didn't um, um, induce protection. The phase three that's ongoing is Mosaico. It's slightly different. Um, it's a, a fully powered phase three study. Um, it's in um, men who have sex with men or transgender individuals. And the um, and the protein um, boost is is slightly different uh, to um, what we had in Imbacoda, and the um, the the mode of acquisition of HIV is also different. Um, there's more prep use in in this group, and um, and we'll we'll know um, probably next year whether this vaccine worked or not, and whether we can derive any 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 um, evidence that. Um, um, vaccines aimed at inducing non-neutralizing antibodies can protect against HIV. So what are the implications of this overall lack of efficacy? Um, we need to do the correlates data to inform future deci decisions. Um, is the, will the Mosaic study work? Um, and um, as an HV10, as our organization, um, we have deprioritized all non-neutralizing approaches. Unless we see something really special in our correlates work, um, we will no longer pursue any interventions that, that induce non-neutralizing antibody approaches. What about neutralizing antibodies? So the M study paves the way to give high-grade prevention from acquisition, especially if we can achieve these at one more than one epitope. So if you remember, um, um, there was a, a, a potent neutralizing antibody targeting the CD4 binding site that was um, was formed, and um, we conducted two studies, one in one in, in South and, and East, East Africa and one in the Americas, um, called the AMP study, and this took place between 2014 and 2020. Um, these are the sites in 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 um, Africa, um, and these are the sites in the Americas. Um, this study um, showed that um, if the virus um, was um, sensitive to the um, VRCO1, uh, there was some protection. So, if you look at the sensitive viruses, we saw a protective efficacy of around 60 to 80 percent. Um, and um, but in in resistance viruses, um, the protective efficacy was was near zero. So this just showed that a one neutralizing antibody is not enough. And like with triple cocktails, if we are going to look at neutralizing antibodies, we need more than one neutralizing antibody to be in sight for to get um, comprehensive effect efficacy. And this this data just shows you um, the protective prevention efficacy um, declines um, um, with increased resistance. And yeah, you can see that um, if there was um, protect, if there was, um, uh, if it was sensitive, um, there was high rates of protect, uh, prevention efficacy. So um, the in vitro sensitivity to VRC01 predicts efficacy, but only against the sensitive viruses, but not against the resistant viruses. So what we need to do is we need to take this um, data coming out of the proof of concept and design um, anti, um, um, active vaccinations that will induce neutralization. And these include things like stable trauma vaccine design, lineage-based vaccine design, germline targeting vaccine design, and epitope-based vaccine design. And um, using all of these, hopefully we can find a way of um, inducing neutralizing antibody responses. These are the approaches that are entering um, clinical development in the HVTN for induction of HIV-specific neutralizing antibodies, as I've mentioned before, and also looking at the gene-based mRNA working with Moderna. The targets um, are all the, um, we, we're working at all these targets, CD4 antibodies and all um, the glycan shields and um, and the um, MPR as well as the GP120, GP41 interface. So looking at this active in, um, in, in children, so um, we, are, we, we believe that it's easier to induce neutralizing antibodies 
in infants and adults. Um, we, we've seen a, that um, children develop high rates of neutralizing antibodies much faster than adults, and that um, and using the um, the sequential isolation of viruses that are associated with body neutralizing antibody induction um, and, and converting these into immunogens, uh, like the GP120 or Sostoprima or both, uh, will hopefully um, lead to an induction of H HIV positive memory B BNAB cells in infants and adults, in, as, as shown in the schema next to you. And so, yeah, we have two studies, one done in Soweto in South Africa, in so all HIV infected uh, women who, who give birth um, uh, we um, approach them and we enroll their babies into a study that's looking at whether we can induce neutralizing antibodies. We um, vaccinate them five times and we're comparing this um, to, to an adult study. And so doing this um, direct comparison will help us understand um, how you can induce body neutralizing antibodies in both adults and infants. So we need to continue to um, uh, with our HIV vaccine endeavors. Okay, we know the results of the efficacy studies. I'm looking at non-neutralizing antibodies, and one study of Mazoka is still outstanding. It's important for us to understand why these vaccines did not work, um, but we do know that M provided a proof of concept for the use of monoclonal antibodies to prevent HIV acquisition, and we need to assess cocktails for monoclonal antibodies for efficacy and, and, and its role in the toolbox. And we're moving forward to look at active immunizations to induce neutralizing antibodies, and this will inform us whether we can advance this concept further and whether the strategy will have a role in preventing mother-to-child transmission and heterosexual uh, transmission. So in 2021 was a very pivotal year. Um, we set out and we had a strategy uh, to understand um, whether we could induce, we could find vaccines that uh, um, that induce non-neutralizing antibodies and whether this could protect against HIV acquisition. And we also went and did a study looking at body neutralizing antibodies. And the strategy that we executed uh, was done incredibly well, and we have the answers of our questions. Um, they're not the question; they're not the answers we wanted, but the road has pointed to the AMP trials is the one we need to follow. We need speed and, and cadence in the HIV vaccine field. We need to make public and the public and funders aware of the need for an HIV vaccine. We need to get reasonable body neutralizing antibodies. Um, uh, um, um, eliciting regimens into clinical trials, and we need to keep up this cadence of success. Um, both of the above are needed to sustain the success of the field. Uh, will we lose HIV vaccine exceptionalism? Can HIV vaccine development, um, uh, like NASA was for COVID vaccine, uh, be reverse engineered? And can we um, get COVID-19 vaccines like the mRNA um, development to help speed up vaccine development? So that's the questions we ask. So um, in terms of the, um, of the iteration gap, um, our pipeline is rich, and the past three years have created an understanding that getting immunogens into clinical trials is needed. We, the clinical trialists, need to pick up this understanding and iterate these trials quickly enough to create a momentum to come forward with a vaccine regimen of scientific plausibility and interest. We need to create a cadence similar to what happened with COVID-19 vaccines, um, and we have a long way to go to achieve any semblance of this goal. I'd like to acknowledge um, all the study staff, the community engagement teams, and most of all, the participants who join us in this journey to try and find an HIV vaccine. And lots of people, um, the HV10, I need to acknowledge um, everybody who's involved in, in this, 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 this scope of work, um, as well as the NIH and DAIDS and our public-private funders um, and pharmaceutical companies that we've worked with. Um, again, just to acknowledge the funders, and I'll end there. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor, Professor Gray, and um, uh, I would like to thank you and also Professor Yasutomi for giving uh, your time to, uh, to be with us today. I would like now to introduce Professor Nicholas Nico Gaivan Pitius. Um, he's currently the Vice Dean of Research and Internationalization in the Faculty of Me Medicine and Health Sciences at um, Stellenbosch University with an extensive portfolio which includes all aspects of research, postgraduate research studies, internationalization and innovation, including intellectual property and technology transfer. Uh, professor uh, van Pitties, Gai van Pitties, is also a full professor in, of molecular biology in the Division of Molecular Biology and Human Genetics of the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Stellenbosch University. And is lastly a core member of both the Department of Science and Technology 
National Research Foundation Center of Excellence in Biomedical Tuberculosis Research and the Medical Research Council Center for Tuberculosis Research that are both hosted by Stellenbosch University. So um, I hand over to you, Professor Geifan uh, Pitis. I'm not sure whether you'd like uh, Professor Gray and Professor um, Esotomi to, to also have their cameras um, on uh, while you are uh, discussing. So if, if I could ask Professor Gray and Professor Yasutomi to also please have your cameras on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cornelison. I, I do hope you can hear me well because they've started to uh, make noises outside uh, the room. So I hope it's not uh, too much of a disturbance. Apologies for that. Uh, they are still building our, our Biomedical Research Institute and so there's some noise outside. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this um, discussion, this roundtable discussion and the webinar. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, uh, and it's a, a great pleasure for me to see Professor Gray and uh, also Professor Yesutomi. And thank you very much for your presentations, uh, which I found uh, extremely interesting. Uh, and a lot of work that's been done by a lot of colleagues over many years to address this uh, disease that um, yeah, that has, has been pointed out, has been around for 40 years. Um, so a large number of work, a large number of funding, large number of people and individuals, volunteers involved. And um, yeah, we, we um, acknowledge all of that. Um, Professor Graham, also glad to hear that there's some advantage sometimes to being bold. Uh, <laughs> I, I personally found that very reassuring. <laughs> Um, so, yes, uh, colleagues, thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, Professor Yasutomi, I'm not able to see you at the moment. I'm not sure if anyone else is. Maybe it's just on my side. Um, is it Professor, Yas Professor Yasutomi is, is, is visible for, for, to us. Okay, so it's probably just on my side then. Apologies for that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I would like to kick off by by asking uh, from from your side, Professor Yasutomi, um, perhaps just some some initial thoughts on the work presented by Professor Gray in terms of the type of work that's done in Africa as compared uh, to to Japan. Is is it possible for you to to perhaps um, say one or two things on that? I can't unfortunately hear you. It's Professor Asutomi, if you could unmute yourself. Hi, it's okay, fine. C can you hear? Yes, thank you. Yes. So, uh, yeah, every time we, we have a plan to, uh, you know, clinical, clinical trial, and the, especially uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult to say, but very attractive for uh, your countries or uh, Okay, uh, you are, uh, sorry. yeah, uh, every time we have a plan to a clinical trial and it's every time focused on the African continent or African countries. And, you know, I, I already talked to, today I already talked about uh, our program, our plan. Our plan may be a ne next step is in your country or African continent. So, I wanna. I have a. You know, uh, I have to. I. Sorry, it's not so good. PC system. Oh. I have to find a, uh, another way to. Uh, next, I have to think about the next step for uh, clinical trial in your country. So I think we have to co cooperate to your country's people. It, it, my answer is, is it okay for you? Sorry, my PC is now yes. not so good con condition. No, no, no problem. Understand? No problem. I think uh, I ah. think you answered that. So yes. So uh, Professor Gray, uh, any any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think, um, we, you know, we want to see um, the next generation of vaccines must induce body neutralizing antibodies. We've, 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 um, done a lot of uh, vaccine trials that have induced um, non-binding antibodies and they don't work. So I think if um, any any vaccine trial that we, we test 
um, we will have to demonstrate um, the production of body neutralizing antibodies. Otherwise, um, um, it, it's not going to work. So, um, you know, so I think that's our approach going forward. Um, that uh, that's the kind of information that we need um, to move forward. I think we've exhausted the non-neutralizing antibody approach. Um, we've done enough trials, now six of them, and um, and they're well powered, um, well executed in areas of high HIV incidence. And so, what we need is um, novel, new novel candidates that have a different um, um, mechanism of protection and induce the kind of neutralizing antibodies that we require. So, you know, um, inactivated and live attenuated vaccines are 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 interesting, and um, and I guess there hasn't been a lot of work. On them because I guess there's been fears, fear of safety issues, particularly with live attenuated and the inactivated. I think has always been an issue around immunogenicity. So if they, if we can move forward with um, with this approach, um, you know, we would need to obviously optimize the safety and make sure that we can induce um, broadly neutralizing antibodies. Thank you, Professor Gray. Uh, Professor Yasu Tome, did you have anything uh, to add to that? Yeah, yes. Uh, yep. Today's uh, neutralizing antibody is a very, very attractive. I understand that. We also have a, another project is a, uh, antibody therapy against a HIV infection. And we use also a high uh, neutralizing activity antibodies in primary system. But important point is that you already, today you already showed us the a neutralizing activity and also a ADCP. It's a very, very important in, in the um, monkey system. We, we saw that because, uh, you know, uh, we use a human neutralizing antibody for primate. So a uh, half life is quite, quite short. So one week or something like that. But HIV was, is controlled over one year. Most of the affected T cell is T cell. So neutralizing antibody induced CD8 positive T cell activity. So we, virus is controlled for a long time. So for neutralizing antibodies is very, very attractive, not only neutralizing, but also induced cellular immune responses. It's very, very attractive in the neutralizing antibody. I think. This is my opinion. Yeah. So so I am I, um, aware that um, some of our audience are not uh, in uh, that uh, well known in, in um, vaccine research. Um, maybe then just taking it a, a, a step up um, given what happened with COVID uh, and the and the success of the mRNA vaccine technologies, uh, mm -hmm. do you think uh, mRNA is the silver bullet? Uh, is that what we should all now be focusing on? Is that the only thing that we now should put all our money and our efforts into? Uh, Prof. Gray, maybe you want to start off? Uh, I don't think we should put um, all our money. Knowing HIV, uh, I think we need to have a backup plans. And so I do think mRNA is, a, is an interesting um, technology and it may have a role in HIV and and TB and I think it's all about the the immunogens you put in and if those immunogens induce the antibody responses like we saw with COVID um, then we're on the right track you know because COVID the mRNA uh, the spike protein produced beautiful neutralizing antibodies which was correlated with protection um, and um, and and so I think if we can see that you know we need we need neutralizing antibodies. Um, to prevent HIV acquisition. Um, and I think we've shown that over and over again. Um, you know, it's nice to have CD4-8, CD4 T cell responses, it's nice to have ADCP and ADCC, blah, blah, blah. But if we don't have um, beautiful neutralizing antibodies at the, at, at, in the vagina, you know, on the penis, um, um, we're not going to protect against um, HIV. So I want to see loads and I need, I want to see buckets full of neutralizing antibodies, um, you know, at the point of where transmission occurs, and and that's that's what we're going for, and it and it, it may be elusive, and I, you know I might uh, die before that ever happens, but uh, that that's what what we need to do. Any thoughts from your side, Professor Yasutomi, on 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 mRNA vaccines and and whether that's the the only thing that we should focus on, the silver bullet? Yeah, um, message RNA vaccine is a very, very attractive, but it's and easy to make it, and uh, you know it's a very, very cheap. 
but only one problem is a very short RNA is possible. So if we think about HIV, we need a you know a couple of mixture message RNA works in cocktail. I think we need it because uh, I already talked to you. Now COVID-19 is just a very small epitope of a spike protein, not the whole length spike protein, so very, very short. So if we think about uh, against HIV infection, uh, five or six or seven or something like that, we have to message RNA vaccine cocktail complex we need, I think. But it's a, you know, easy to make it. So it is very, very attractive. If we try to, oh, this one is not good, but we next make, uh, next one is easy to make it. So try and try and try and try and try, very, very easy. You know, it's usual recombinant virus or recombinant protein. To, well, we need a very long time to make it or something. And of course, uh, uh, FDA or email or PNT or something like that, quality check is very, very difficult to another recombinant virus or recombinant protein. But messenger RNA is very, 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 very clear to make it. So one facility makes uh, many type of messenger RNA vaccine. It's a very, very attractive. This is my opinion. And so, if it if it is that attractive for for your side, are you are you um, already starting to investigate that in Japan as a as a potential um, uh, on a on a parallel um, track? Yeah, in a, uh, in Japan also uh, um, make now making makes a message RNA vaccine against uh, COVID nineteen, but next. You know, before the uh, before pandemic of uh, COVID-19, we already made it uh, Mars vaccine by using a messenger RNA technology. But Mars is gone from from Japan now. It's a, it's a very small Southeast area. Well, so uh, we are very, very familiar to that technology, and also a very short time is a very very attractive before pandemic. So we have to think about HIV as a very, very reasonable. Sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking about um, manufacturing and, and the capacity, um, colleagues, how, would, uh, how do you feel about the, about the nationalism, the vaccine nationalism that we saw during the pandemic and, and the, uh, you know, the fact that, um, or do you believe it's necessary for, for all countries to have their own manufacturing capacity, given what we saw? Do, do you think we can, as a humanity on, on one, in, one single planet, uh, come together and, and discuss a better way of doing this in the future? Yeah, I think that we should, as a humanity, um, find a way of dealing with nationalism and um, vaccine equity. Um, but you know, um, before that happens, I guess each na each nation thinks that they now need to take care of themselves. Um, I do think that um, vaccine manufacturing capability is important in in on the African continent because it it, it drives innovation, it it creates um, uh, skills and and creates a, a pharmaceutical pipeline, not just for um, COVID or future vaccines, but maybe for MMR. Um, and and uh, HPV and and other vaccines. So, um, in order in order to to drive the innovation economy, um, investing in pharmaceutical manufacturing is not a bad idea. And you know we could learn from countries like India and South Korea um, to become you know um, to to become experts in this field. So I think it's part of economic growth, and um, and um, we all build great at a global level. There's a dearth of um, good manufacturing capability, and we saw that with the, um, with plants, even in the U.S., being closed down for contamination, and the issues that, that a lot of um, when you go to scale and you're making billions of vaccines, is that um, there are very few people that can do it. And so, even if we are involved, you know, it's nice to be involved from the beginning in reagent development, but even if you are involved in fill and finish, that, that still takes a huge amount of expertise and is job creating. So I like um, vaccine manufacturing because I think it, it builds a, a an innovation um, pipeline and a, a it, and it um, you know it 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 um, it helps us I think if, you know in the future for lots of other things. So I would say that um, we should be able to 
uh, contribute to, at a global level um, in manufacturing, even in South Africa or even from the African continent? Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Asutomi. Um, I, I must uh, say I'm very ignorant about the capacity in Japan, but I assume that it's quite good. Um, or, or do you think there's still room for improvement in terms of vaccine manufacturing? Yes, I think uh, it's a two type of stories. One is, uh, of course, we, we have to make a, a facility or manufacturing facility for uh, worldwide contributions. But the other thing is the Japanese government supported, uh, for example, Gavi Alliance, Global Vaccine Alliance. Of course, uh, you know that Japanese government every year supported the Gavi Alliance and also for COVID-19, Japanese government uh, supported also uh, uh, COVAX system. COVAX means, uh, you know, uh, develop our country's vaccine to uh, give the uh, uh, developing country to developing countries. So I think two systems, one is uh, manufacturing or some, something, it's a uh, hard. And also a software is a Gabi Alliance or, uh, you know, uh, COVAX system or something like that. And now Gabi, uh, CEO of Gabi Alliance is uh, Seth Buckley. He was a, a C, he was a previous CEO of IABI. International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. So he knows of uh, vaccine development system. So, you know, very uh, expert over the AIDS area. So, what I think it's, I will say again, it's a two system. One is a hard manufacture, and second one is a soft system. You, we have to need, make another system for next pandemic. It may be a uh, WHO or UN or something like that. They have to think about that. And we, are, of course, I agree with all these Japanese people. So uh, support the vaccine program. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, our, um, our thanks for that, um, for those efforts. I think that uh, that was really well appreciated from everyone, uh, the countries who stepped up and really actually contributed to, to that. So thank you very much from, from our side also. Um, you mentioned uh, other vaccines, uh, Professor Gray. Um, wh how do you see the future in terms of vaccine? Would we have uh, one shot with everything in it, uh, HIV and MMR and everything else? Well, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the vaccine platform. And I guess that's where the, maybe the inactivated um, vaccines uh, may have a, a role. Um, or the um, vector, the viral vector-based, if you can you know, put the various immunogens in. Um, I guess mRNA, um, you know, also whether one could, um, whether you make, um, whether you could co-formulate uh, would be an interesting uh, strategy uh, for the future. You know, obviously we've done it in EPI, we've done it in pediatric, we've managed to put a, a whole stack of vaccines in, in one for babies. And so hopefully we could do that uh, for the future um, for, for other things. Um, I think it's important. I mean, so the COVID-19 was a huge success, and I guess it was maybe because the the spike protein um, induced neutralizing antibodies. And so this was a, you know, and whatever whatever vaccine you you made, you more or less got protection. And the question is whether whether how we can take the findings from the COVID vaccines and put it into harder, you know, harder things like TB and HIV, and um, you know how we can rapidly translate that into into the hard the malaria, HIV and TB, which we haven't been able to find um, effective vaccines for. So I think hopefully what what will happen is that this COVID vaccine uh, technology will hopefully induce innovation in in other in other areas where we've struggled to find an, an HIV, I mean a, a vaccine. Um, I think the important thing also to to note about TB, HIV and malaria, is that there's very little pharmaceutical investment in in that area because of the high risk, you know, the risks of failure, and um, and, and you know, no one who has a, a shareholder wants to invest in vaccines that are going to fail year after year, and so um, and you know and the other problem is is that um, these these diseases are diseases of Africa and of poor people, and so there's not global interest. And so, you know, I'm very heartened to see that Japan is interested um, in, you know, in looking at, at HIV vaccines and is interested in, in you know, in, in trying to find solutions because um, 
these problems in a, um, are, are, are kind of our problems in Africa. And so we do need to collaborate with countries like Japan um, and uh, work with scientists from Japan, work, you know, foster the kind of collaborations that we've had, like we've had with the NIH um, and we've had with IRV is to work with um, with Japan as well. So I, you know, I see this as a wonderful opportunity to um, for you know for Stellenbosch University to forge ties and to and to see how we can work um, with um, um, scientists who are developing novel um, approaches and see whether we could support the clinical development. So I think that's what's exciting um, with this with this discussion. And um, I hope that um, this this goes further than just this um, webinar, because otherwise you've wasted all our time if nothing happens. So we yeah. have to. You, um, you know, I'm going to be phoning you every three months and ask you what happened. You know, um, what's happened with the with with the collaborations with with the Japanese, and I hope that um, we see something happen, um, and that we work with you know with our collaborators with our scientists in Japan. Otherwise. Um, you know, it's it's it, it, it you know it, it, it's more it's very important to forge these collaborations and do the work with with people and develop relationships. Yeah, thank you. And um, sorry, this noise is becoming very <laughs> is becoming worse. But uh, I hope you can still hear me. Uh, thank you. I wanted to say, uh, and we we saw in the past two years how quickly um, one uh, country's problem can become everyone's problem. Uh, so that that is true, uh, Professor uh, Yasutomi. Uh, Professor Gray mentioned tuberculosis and other uh, diseases. We know that tuberculosis and HIV are quite good friends, especially in our setting. Um, uh, your thoughts around um, combinations of vaccines in terms of TB, HIV? Yes, you know, uh, I'm also a member of uh, uh, CDVD, Co Collaboration of TB Vaccine Discovery in Gates Foundation. And I've been to uh, South Africa 2013, SATBVI, for my TB, TB vaccine research. And today I showed you an uh, adjuvant, antigen 85V is uh, one of the vaccine, vaccine agent, antigen of TB tuberculosis. So it's a very, very close to like that. And, yeah, you know, malaria, TB, and HIV is a chronically infected disease. This is very difficult to make a vaccine. Well, COVID-19 is a, you know, it's a chronic, not a chronic infection. So first of all, a neutralizing antibody or cellular immune response is very short time we need it, but chronic infection is a, just a little bit different. So chronically infected vaccine is a very, very rare. For example, HBB is a successful, and others are all, most of uh, chronically infected infection um, pathogen vaccine is uh, attenuated vaccine. Malaria attenuate, TB attenuate, HIV attenuate, it's very, very difficult to make it. And also TB, we have only one vaccine, BCG, it's attenuated bovine mycobacteria. So attenuated vaccine is a very, very attractive, but Malaria, TB, and HIV is very, very difficult to use. So we have still problem is that these three, uh, three infectious, uh, three infectious diseases, also including uh, hepatitis C virus. It's uh, also we have no vaccine. It's also a uh, chronically infected uh, disease. So I have to think about it just a little bit. You know. Uh, we think uh, real, real world data, you have it, African continent or your country have a real world data. But we have a just, uh, you know, a technique or uh, you know, science or something like that, we have no real world data, TB and HIV. It's a very, very few patients in Japan. So we, ha I think it's a collaborate with your country. I mean, of course, your country's people collaborate with America, Europe, or something like that. It's a very important point. Every so scientists very, very interesting in your countries. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for those that, those words also. And I would like to echo what both you and Prof. Gray said in terms of collaboration and the importance of that. And um, yeah, uh, colleagues, I, I realize we are at a quarter to two now, and I uh, need to end off with this roundtable. 
So I would like to once again thank uh, our two speakers, Prof. Gray, Prof. Um, uh, Yasutomi. Uh, there will be now time from the audience to also ask questions, and that will be led by Professor Cornelison. From my side, uh, if you if you forget everything, just remember that you that what we want is bucket full buckets full of uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I think that's <laughs> that's the message, but also then collaboration is extremely important and we do value the relationship with our partners in other countries and specifically in this sense also then Japan. Thank you very much from my side. I'm going to um, have to leave now. I have another appointment, but I, I really enjoyed this interaction and I'm going to hand over to Professor Cornelis now. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Professor Khaifan uh, Pitius. And I know that um, everybody has a, has a very busy schedule today and uh, I very much appreciate that um, you've uh, given your time. So um, we would like to use the remaining um, what well, about 10 minutes to um, uh, get some uh, questions from the audience. While we, we wait for um, the audience to, to post the questions, we can also um, raise your hand if you'd like to, 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 to put your, your question directly to, to the speakers. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, Professor Yasutomi, so um, the, the, the research that you reported on, um, the next step is uh, to, to do um, uh, uh, clinical trials in, in, in humans, um, if I understand uh, correctly. So could you, could you um, uh, uh, give some further detail about that? And then also you mentioned, you mentioned that, um, oh, so, so I'll, I, will, I will give you a chance to, to, to respond to that first. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, we have to we have to uh, move, move forward uh, for clinical trial and we also uh, you know uh, engagement of a patient HIV infected patient in Japan and first of all I already talked to a, a tailor made vaccine I isolated from my HIV infected patient and makes uh, anti NEF deleted and anti 85B adjuvant molecule expressed virus and back to original patient is a tailor-made vaccine. And if this type of vaccine is a success or many, we can get many success. Next steps is a common sequence virus vaccine for African peoples. So maybe, I, of course, you understand that it's African epidemic subtype or something like that. We make the NIF deleted and IgN 5 b or as an adjuvant molecule expressed vaccines for use uh, not only therapeutic but also preventive vaccine in your countries and this usually uh, I already talked to you uh, attenuated AIDS virus is not so safe because uh, it's a chronical infection but I already showed you uh, uh, adjuvant molecule express virus is gone 100 percent eliminated so very you know very safety and also have a induce a very high quality of immune responses. So first of all, uh, Teramed vaccine in Japan, the next year is a uh, common sequence virus in, I hope, your countries. Thank you very much. Um, there is one question from the floor. Um, there are two questions. So I think there was first um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Tami, Tami and Mr. Flabo, and then uh, we have the second question. So um, Tami. Thank you, uh, Prof. Cornelison, and uh, good afternoon. So uh, I joined you slightly a little bit late, but uh, Prof. Uh, Gray was speaking, and uh, she said that uh, HIV/AIDS uh, is, is 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 an African disease. So or maybe I got it wrong, where you said this is an African disease or an African problem. Can you just please elaborate on that, Prof.? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, most of the infections that happen um, happen in, in Africa and happen in young women. So at a global level, um, we, we bear the burden um, of HIV, like TB. So we have the highest um, prevalence of TB um, and the highest prevalence of HIV um, as compared to other countries. So, um, um, so um, at a global level, more infections happen. In, in Africa than anywhere else. I, I see this, but also perhaps if the that is true, what you're saying, 
but maybe the wording of it doesn't it give like a very misleading uh, perception to other nations that maybe they countries or they people can't contract HIV and diseases as easily as African people can. Uh, you know, I think I think everybody knows what I was saying. Um, that that we bear the burden, like TB and HIV, we bear the burden, and um, we have to find we have high incidence. We have HIV incidence of four percent in women, and which hasn't changed since '96. And so um, we have to find solutions, and we have to find an HIV vaccine. And um, uh, diseases diseases like HIV and TB are neglected um, because there's little interest at a global level for finding solutions that people won't make money from. So I don't think we can ignore the, the geopolitical issues around that. And, um, and you know, we, we have to find solutions for people, for things that, that, that we bear the burden of and, um, and that uh, where we have more incidents than anywhere else in the world. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Professor um, Gwai. I think the, um, and as the, uh, the, the person, who, uh, as Mr. Mflabo uh, mentioned, he, he joined a little bit later, so perhaps missed the, 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 the detail and the nuance also of the discussion so far. I think the context for, for the um, uh, statement was that um, Sub-Saharan Africa bears the burden of um, uh, uh, most of the, um, uh, um, the challenging um, epidemics um, that you know, the global community um, faces and that uh, what also complicates things is that sometimes there's not a lot of appetite by um, global investors to um, uh, uh, invest and, and develop the facilities um, uh, within Africa or, 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 or outside of Africa um, to, to, to deal with these pandemics or to, to deal with these diseases rather like um, malaria and TB and so forth. I think that if I got that correctly, that was the context of, of your your, your argument. There is one um, question by Tando Tando Tolo. Uh, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, uh, thank you for the presentations to all the professors, and thank you for the the debate. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. I wish it could could go on and on and on and on because it was a, a informative. I wanted to ask the question uh, from Professor Yasutomi around the, the monkeys that were not, uh, did not respond positively to, to the vaccine. What could have been the problem? Was it the viral load? Was it the duration of, uh, of, of their disease in them? Was it the antibodies? Um, was it the lack of a bucket full of antibodies? What, what, what could have been the problem? Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, in our ex experiment our study is to, of course i i measure the neutralizing antibody and the serial immune responses and uh, this type of vaccine is a very very important point is a serial immune responses of because uh, just nearly deleted virus control virus shiv ni it, it uh, can induce a high response of neutralizing antibody more than adjuvant viruses but adjuvant virus can induce a very high cellular immune responses compared with control virus. So this type of, in this time, our effector cell is, uh, of, co uh, of course, including the antibody, but major effector cell is a CD8 positive T cells. So if you are interested in uh, our result, my paper is, uh, a free open access paper. So, if you if you have a time, please read it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor um, Gray. Um, as as a layperson, the the speed with which a COVID nineteen pan the COVID nineteen um, vaccine was developed is is it's it's quite striking and and it's quite quite um, com prominent compared to um, uh, other work that that has been done. For HIV and and other other diseases. Um, so aside from biological factors, um, do you think that there are other reasons why um, there has not yet been um, success with an HIV vaccine? I think the biological factors and the scientific factors are very hard to overcome, um, and certainly um, you know the endeavours have been 
have been um, you know have been hard. But also to emphasize is that um, a lot of the vaccine development has come from the public purse, and so um, the the taxpayer and federal funds have funded it because um, there's no pharmaceutical interest, and um, and you know and which is different. Um, it was actually not really different because the public purse paid for COVID-19 vaccines. You know, the the public purse took the risk, and the pharmaceutical companies benefited. Um, but you know, but I, it, it also makes me, you know, one does think about the, the again, the political context um, of this, and that um, at a global level, people threw huge resources into um, COVID-19, and you know, governments paid for took the risk and paid for the clinical development. Um, and 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 um, and that does also speak volumes around um, the politics of science and um, in the politics of disease. And um, and you know, and again and again it emphasizes the, the issue I raised about um, the lack of interest um, that only the public purse is paying for vaccine development in HIV and TB um, um, because um, um, uh, um, Pharmaceutical companies do not perceive that to, they'll make a profit out of it, and then the investment is so great that um, that they that they that they their shareholders are not interested, and um, and you know, and then obviously you come into the whole argument of 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 um, you know who drives the agenda and and why do poor people um, not get the kind of treatment that they deserve or the kind of investment um, in vaccines um, that that affect um, people that. Um, like TB and, and HIV. Thank you very much, Professor Gray. Um, I'm a political scientist, um, so I think what you say sort of affirms what I've been thinking all along. It's not about medical science or natural science, it's about political science. And that's that's a wonderful way to, to end off um, the discussion today, uh, Professor Yasutomi. Uh, so the, the last um, question to you. Uh, so Professor Gray, has has thrown a challenge to to us today to um, actually make work of collaboration and to 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 um, make a concerted effort to to continue the conversation um, uh, towards uh, uh, cooperation between Japan and and South Africa in this specific um, research uh, field. Um, do you have any any ideas in terms of the own work that 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 your own work that you um, are doing? Me. So, so do you do you have any ideas in terms of how to to take uh, this further, uh, the the research that that your that your laboratory is doing, and and what possible avenues for collaboration there is with scientists in in uh -huh. South Africa? Okay, so uh, if uh, if you have any meeting or something uh, something like that, yes, I can go to go to your countries because a lot. I already talked to you. Uh, uh, 2013, I w went to your countries. It's a TB, TB researchers. So South Africa TB vaccine initiative. I guess if you have any meeting or something like that, I can go to like this. And also, uh, uh, TCAD. Yeah. I have the. I I ever talked in the TCAD. It's a TB TB sections and the vaccine storage. So I think that this. This type of system we have to use. If, and uh, I say again, if you have any meeting or something like that, give me information. I can go that. I can join. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, I'd like to thank uh, you, Professor Yasutomi, and Professor Gray for um, the excellent presentations today and for the very enriching um, discussions. Um, there is a, a question by Tandu Kolo about what happens, the next steps in terms of publicizing. Um, uh, these studies. So uh, part of, 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 of that would be us um, making available the uh, recording of today's webinar um, on our webinar website. Uh, we'll post the de we'll send the details to, to all the persons who, who had registered. Mm -hmm. And then um, yes, Professor Gray, the, the challenge is, 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 is you've given us the challenge to, to continue the work um, uh, going forward. So I would like to, to conclude and thank you very much for um, for your time and for your insights. Thank you so much.